Good afternoon, and welcome to a webinar on temporary marketing permits hosted by EAS Consulting Group and presented by EAS Independent Consultant, April Cates. EAS specializes in FDA regulatory matters with a prime focus of assisting domestic and foreign food, pharmaceutical, dietary supplement, medical device, cosmetic, and tobacco firms comply with applicable laws and regulations. EAS is staffed with former FDA compliance and inspection officials and industry executives, and is assisted by an extensive network of consultants with many years of FDA and industry experience. Today's presenter is April Cates. Prior to consulting, Ms. Cates was an FDA Supervisory Consumer Safety Officer. She has also worked with USDA's Food Safety and Inspection Service Federal State Audit Branch. In industry, she served as manager of regulatory compliance in McCormick Spice Company and as a food regulatory specialist at American Ingredients Company, now Corbion. As a reminder, during the webinar, you may ask any questions by typing them into the chat box. With that, I will say thank you again for joining EAS and I'll turn the presentation over to April Cates. Hello and welcome to our webinar about food standards of identity and temporary marketing permits. As uh, you already know, I'm April Cates and I hope you find this presentation informative and useful. Before I start talking about standards of identity, I wanted to provide you with a little context. As you know, FDA requires certain types of information on food packages and identity labeling of food is one of them. FDA's regulations also require information such as net weight, nutrition labeling, name and place of business, but the identity of a food is what we'll be discussing in this webinar. In section 21 CFR 101.3, FDA allows three options for labeling the identity of a food product. They're shown here and are pretty self-explanatory. First is where a name is one specified by law or regulation, such as a standard of identity, and an example of that would be Parmesan cheese. The second is for a common and usual name of a food, and an example of that would be something like a cracker or a tortilla. Most people know what a cracker is, and there's no federally regulated standard for crackers. And finally, third, is when a food can be described by a descriptive term or a fanciful name everybody knows. An example here would be a product like marshmallows, which don't have a federal standard. The name doesn't precisely describe what they are, but most people know what it is anyway. So let's go back to the first bullet point on the previous slide. We're on slide three now. Where regulation or law specifies what the identity is of a food, there are two types of regulations that can put this in place. The first way is for a food identity to be regulated um, as a standard of identity under part 130 of the regulations, 21 CFR part 130. The standards of identity have specific recipe requirements and also specify the name of any product purporting to meet that standard. The second is for a common and unusual name regulation under 21 CFR part 102 subpart B. Examples of products in this category would be shrimp cocktail and onion rings made from diced onions. The requirements for non-standardized foods are less recipe driven than labeling driven in that it may require certain statements on the label such as made from diced onions for onion rings. As another example, the regulations for juice containing beverages are also under part 102, and they specify how individual juice components must be declared on the label. 102.5 explains the general principles around giving food a common or usual name, and among them, FDA states the name shall be uniform among all identical and similar products and may not be confusingly similar to the name of another food not encompassed in the same name. So now let's talk about standards of identity. Here is the legislative basis of FDA standards of identity, section uh, 401 of the Federal Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act. Section 401 permits the secretary to establish standards of identity for foods. Section 401 even states which foods will not be given definitions and standards, such as fresh fruits and vegetables. Section 401 also permits FDA to designate the optional ingredients in a formulated food. And one of the biggest um, 
hurdles for a standard is that it promotes honesty and fair dealing in the interest of consumers. And that's pretty much the way FDA looks at standards and, and judges their merits. For our example of Parmesan cheese that I talked about earlier, the standard of identity specifies in 21 CFR 133-165, the maximum amount of moisture and minimum fat content, among other things, and also states the minimum aging time of the cheese at 10 months. Okay, there are approximately 200 food standards of identity in FDA's regulations. Um, a lot of them were written a really long time ago and with the intent of making the names of food product standard so consumers would know what to expect when they purchased a particularly named food product. If you think about ketchup, which has a standard of identity, when consumers purchase that, they generally expect a sweet, sour, viscous, tomatoey sauce that goes with French fries. Food standards of identity are recipe specific, as I mentioned earlier, um, although sometimes certain quality standards are also incorporated. For example, in the bottled water standard, there are specific analytical tests that bottled water must meet in order to be considered the standardized product. Sometimes standards of identity can be revised or revoked. FDA recently revoked, and when I say recent, I mean within the past two years, the standard of identity of artificially sweetened jams and jellies because of the impact of section uh, 130.10, which I haven't talked about much yet, but that allows a standardized food with a nutrient content claim to have formulation changes made to accommodate that claim. In other situations, FDA can decide that time has come to revoke a standard just because it's outdated and no longer needed. FDA, for example, has a single standardized identity for a frozen fruit pie, cherry, and none other. It calls for certain numbers of cherries to be in that pie. FDA has been petitioned for revocation of that standard of identity. This slide summarizes uh, some of the things I've already talked about and a couple of new things. Um, these are the main points about standards of identity. They define a food by describing its basic nature and essential characteristics, and they tend to be recipe based. Some food standards will set nutritional requirements for a product, and examples of that would be uh, enriched bread, enriched flour, and enriched macaroni products. And some food standards, as I mentioned earlier, uh, include quality requirements, quality standards. And another example other than the water that I mentioned earlier would be canned apricots that don't permit more than one pit in eight ounces of finished product. Okay, so um, if you remember that old geometry adage about how a rectangle cannot always be a square, but a square is always a rectangle, the food standards regulations are a little bit like that in that if a product uses the standard of identity term to describe itself, then it must meet the standards of identity in the by all the requirements. So if I call something Parmesan cheese, it can have no more than 32% moisture and not less than 32% milk fat. Conversely, if you have a product that is called something that is not a standard of identity term, such as topping cheese, it is not permitted to be called that if it meets the requirements in the Parmesan cheese standard. So if a food meets the standard of identity requirements that are in the regulations, the identity term must be used. So let's talk a little bit more about food standards of identity. The standards regulations have some general provisions that apply across all food standards. In section 130.3, the regulation lays out that no matter where in the regulations the name of a standardized food appears, it would mean the same thing. FDA, for example, requires that all foods called peanut butter are the same thing, no matter where in the regulations they appear. And this would apply to ingredients as well as food names, but most especially, and in the case we're talking about, for standards. Section 130.3 also says that all other regulations about adulteration and misbranding also apply to standardized foods and their ingredients. Here are more provisions that apply to standard, uh, standardized foods. Section 130.5 lays out the way that a new food standard can be created. Basically, a firm or an individual can petition for a new standard if the new standard would promote honesty and fair dealing in the interest of consumers. Also, the petitioner must be able to show evidence to substantiate the petition and be able to do so in a public hearing if one becomes necessary. 
It is a public process. Um, once a docket is opened, FDA would assign the petition and the reviewer uh, would assign the petition and the reviewer of that petition would look it over and hold internal meetings within FDA to deliberate its merits. And as you can imagine, all this takes a lot of time. FDA must develop a petition response. If they believe, that, believe there's merit to the petition, they may publish a notice in the Federal Register asking for the public to comment on the establishment of a new standard. In this case, FDA will review and consider the comments provided. If this process continues, FDA would draft and publish a notice of proposed rulemaking. Once this is published in the Federal Register, the public would again get to comment. And once FDA considers the comment, they would then publish a final rule. And as you can imagine, this process can take years to be completed. Section 21 CFR 130.8 talks about conformity to definitions and standards of identity. But the funny thing about that is that this section is actually about when a food does not conform to the standard. And the specifics are listed here. Basically, if you put something directly into a food that is prohibited specifically in the standard, or if you leave something out that is called for in the standard, or if you put in too much or too little of a required ingredient, then the food is no longer considered the standardized product. An ingredient that has no provision for it in the standard of identity may only be added as an incidental additive introduced at a non-functional and insignificant level as a result of its deliberate and purposeful addition to another permitted ingredient. Section 13010 um, provides some leeway in the standards of identity, and it is a relatively recent regulation. Um, it provides for allowing changes to a standard of identity food if the name of that food and that food would be accompanied by a nutrient content claim. So that provides for foods we see on store shelves today, such as low-fat mayonnaise, low-fat sour cream, and even reduced sodium Swiss cheese. FDA used to have a standard for certain products, um, such as reduced fat milks, but with 13010s, those were revoked. This regulation um, allows the food to be modified as long as it's accompanied by that nutrient content claim. And there are certain requirements. For example, the food must meet the definition for the nutrient content claim and not be nutritionally inferior to the standardized food. It must perform similarly to the standardized food and a firm is allowed to revise the formula accordingly to accomplish the intended effect. So for an example, if somebody is creating a low fat mozzarella cheese, it still must melt on the pizza. I'll address more of the specifics in the next slide. This slide describes the ingredients provision under 13010 for standardized foods. So if something is prohibited in a standardized food specifically, under 13010, it would still be prohibited. Conversely, if an ingredient is called for by the standard of identity, it would still be required in the 13010 version. So let's say I wanted to make a low cholesterol egg noodle. Well, the noodle standard calls for egg as an ingredient. So I would still be required to have egg in that product. I would just have to find eggs with the cholesterol removed to use. Okay. Um, so uh, another option a firm would have is uh, to modify a standard of identity. And if you wanted to do that, it would be in general the same as petitioning for a new standard. The firm would need to petition FDA and the cycle of federal register notices and comments and proposed and final regulations would still need to be published by FDA in the federal register. And as with establishing a new standard, it would take a very long time. So. Now we finally arrived at the center of our plate of this webinar, temporary marketing permits, better known as TMPs. So I've talked about establishing a new standard of identity and modifying a standard of identity. What other options would a firm have to produce a standard of identity food with some type of change? If a manufacturer wanted to pr produce a food outside of the standard of identity or modify the standardized product, and then test market. This provision, 13017 of the regulations, allows a firm to send a request for a temporary marketing permit to FDA. 
when a food is produced under a TMP, it can be revised from the standard in a specified way without triggering enforcement action by FDA. 13017 specifies what the TMP application must include, and it sets out a process for review and approval. TMPs are in general granted for 15 months, and firms have the option to extend it, but the extension request must be submitted no less than three months prior to the original TMP expiration date. So let's talk about the application to start. FDA's TMP regulation is extremely prescriptive about what information the agency needs to consider in the application for a TMP. It's also rather clear, and firms that have been through the process will tell you that it pays to read the requirements of the regulation carefully before you put your TMP package together. When I worked at FDA, it was not unusual to see TMP applications that left out some very pertinent information such as the amount of product that would be produced under the TMP and the places it would be distributed and even where it was to be manufactured. This is really important because when the TMP is supposed to be a limited test of a revised standard of identity food, um, it's important because if an FDA inspector comes into a food plant and sees a deviation from a standardized food being produced, that temporary marketing permit allows that firm to continue that without having enforcement action taken against them. Part of the application involves the applicant explaining very clearly what they are doing and why they believe modification is a good thing. FDA needs to understand the rationale and whether it is a benefit to the consumer. The purpose of the change is very important. Okay, so you see this really long laundry list and it continues on the next slide. This is a continuation. As you can see, FDA wants to see a proposed version of the label that will be used on the temporary marketing permit food product. TMP applications are the one exception to FDA not normally providing pre-market label approvals. This is the one case where FDA actually looks at that label because the label is supposed to provide a means for the consumer to distinguish between the tested food and the standardized food. When I worked at FDA, there were times that the draft labels did not accompany the TMP application. And as you all know, um, now that's a very important part of this process. Uh, sometimes upon review, FDA may request certain changes to the TMP label, and these changes must be made, and the revisions to the labels must be reviewed again and approved prior to the TMP being approved by FDA. Okay, so. Let's say you apply for a temporary marketing permit, you carefully put your package together and you send it into FDA. So what happens? Well, first thing is that once it arrives at FDA, the TMP application is assigned to a member of the product evaluation and labeling team on the food labeling and standard staff. The staff member will first look to see that the application is complete. If they have any questions, the firm would be contacted by phone or email. Clarifications will be requested if necessary, and the firm is responsible for supplying additional information or providing a letter to amend the original TMP application. Once all the required information is provided, the FDA staff member reviews the complete application and the standard of identity that it is seeking to modify. Sometimes um, all parties need to be sure, and there might be a phone call meeting where everyone can understand what's being requested and how it would change the standard. Sometimes the applicant, upon discussion with FDA, will decide to revise their temporary marketing permit on their own accord. You need to keep in mind that all this takes time. If a firm does not respond to FDA's request for more information or revisions to labels, the TMP will not move ahead. Okay, so uh, next slide, please. Okay, this is the approval process. Once FDA reviews the complete application, their decision on the TMP will be provided by a formal letter. At the same time, FDA will issue a notice in the Federal Register informing the public that the temporary market application has been approved. The test period begins on the date the person holding the TMP permit introduces the food covered by this permit into interstate commerce but it can't happen any later than three months after notice of the TMP issuance is published in the Federal Register. The firm must notify FDA in writing of the date that their test market has actually begun. 
So let's say the temporary marketing permit is going well and a firm is selling this new version of the standardized food, but they decide they need a little more time to decide what they want to do. Under these circumstances, a firm can apply to FDA for an extension of the temporary marketing permit. The request to extend the temporary marketing permit must be filed with FDA, as I said earlier, no later than three months before the original temporary marketing permit expiration date, because that gives FDA time to review and consider the extension request. And if it is approved, there won't be any time that test products will be considered violative and out in the market. The request for the extension must be accompanied by a petition to amend the standard of identity. Um, and when and if FDA grants the extension, they will also invite all interested parties to participate in the market test under the same conditions. Those who participate must also file a temporary marketing permit, but it is not quite as lengthy a process. When the petition that accompanies the TMP extension is accepted by FDA, the docket is opened. FDA will not immediately act on the petition because that's a separate and very long process. So if FDA agrees to extend the temporary marketing permit, another notice is published in the Federal Register and the difference between the temporary marketing permit, the initial one and the extension is that under the extended temporary marketing permit, FDA invites everyone who else who wants to apply to join in the fund and that the extended temporary marketing permit never ends, and it won't expire until FDA either grants or denies the petition to change the food standard of identity. The producer can market that food, that modified standardized food, per the TMP with no end date. So I'm going to talk a little bit about people who join in the extended TMP fund. The firm making a Me Too request must still state the amount and provide labeling of their test product. So they still have to let FDA know how much they're going to produce and where it's going to be distributed and where it's going to be made. But they don't have to reinvent the entire process of explaining the merits of the change or anything because it's already been approved by FDA. They can reference the extended temporary marketing permit in their letter and that will be enough since the record has already been established. Another Federal Register notice will be published by FDA when the Me Too temporary marketing permit is granted. And like the original one, a firm has 90 days to get their test product into commerce unless FDA has provided a different timing. Okay, so we've described how a temporary marketing put it, is put into place and how it can be extended. What about ending it? Well, if a firm chooses not to extend their temporary marketing permit, it will end at that 15 month deadline. And we said um, the TMP officially ends on the effective date of the petition to amend the food standard being granted or 30 days after the petition would have been denied for the extension. Um, but sometimes FDA could revoke a temporary marketing permit for other reasons, and those are shown here somebody wasn't truthful about what they were doing, if the product does not meet the conditions of the permit, those are examples of when FDA would terminate the temporary marketing permit. And again, as with all other aspects of the temporary marketing permit process, FDA will publish the notice of the action being taken in the Federal Register. So, um, this is useful information. FDA keeps a listing of the active temporary marketing permits on their website, and this is the, uh, the address of it. Um, and firms can open the link to see what's covered by TMPs. And as you can see, this is an example of what's out there right now. And some of them have been extended, and um, some of them, uh, I guess all of them have extensions on them. I've copied the link, and this is a copy of what the page actually looks like. So that's it. I think I've covered everything uh, about temporary marketing permits and I thank you for calling in and listening today.
Thanks, April. Sorry, I was having trouble getting my microphone off. We have our first question, which is how long does it take FDA to acknowledge that they have received a TMP application? Um, usually, usually the um, TMP application um, acknowledgement will take a month or less um, for a letter to come from FDA to the firm. It may or may not be accompanied by questions, but they definitely will acknowledge it within a month after receipt. And uh, we have a question about common or usual names. Does FDA have a list of these names? Um, no. <laughs> there are the common or usual names in the regulations in section 102 of the regulations that does specify some um, products that have received common or usual names by regulation, but other common and usual names, there is no list um, that FDA keeps. Although uh, they often get questions and, and respond. And um, that's interesting because uh, with all the new ethnic foods and there are just a lot of new products out on the market, sometimes it's a challenge for a firm to come up with a common or usual name. And uh, FDA does recognize that. I mean, my staff used to write letters uh, to those inquiries all the time. Um, and if a common or usual name wasn't available, we would try and assist a firm if they needed a uh, descriptive term to use. Thank you. Uh, we have another question. Does a TMP grant exclusivity to the company getting the permit to market? Uh, not, no. Um, if um, a because it's a public process, if somebody sees that um, a Federal Register notice granting a TMP application and uh, for what it is, um, anybody else, even if it's before the extension, has the right to also submit a complete temporary marketing permit to FDA to do something very similar. Um, I don't believe. Um, you know, formulas are kept, um, that's, um, you know, private business information. But if somebody wants to test market along the same lines with a similar idea, there's nothing really stopping them. The next question is versus uh, fanciful versus common or usual names. Is there a time period that one can use to determine if something is now common? Is it 20 years, 10 years? or um, whether it shows in popular recipe books or sources? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, well, when I was at FDA, I used to hear the 20 year mark being bounced around, but I don't know if that's the case now, and I'm not sure how hard and fast that rule would be. Um, it really isn't anything that's in writing particularly, and I think it would have to go by, um, how accepted and, and how well understood something is. Uh, FDA's interest is that consumers have a total understanding of what they're buying and that there's no um, possible room for deception to happen. So um, I guess if, 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 if you think of it that way, a term would have to be used for a really long time to make sure that it's common or usual. But that's always been a very, I guess it's kind of a gray area. Our next question is regarding an exemption for listing incidental additives. Uh, and the example is if a cookie is baked with a vanilla extract, must I declare the ingredients of the vanilla extract? Or can I use the exemption for listing incidental additives? Um, if a if uh, that's a good question i think i would need to i would i think i would need to respond to that later that that could be a complicated answer <laughs> i'm not okay. sure i have the, all that in front if, of me right now sure if the person who asked that question um would email that in uh, we can get an answer to you all right um you mentioned information that is frequently missing from TMP applications. Could you repeat those and any other details that are often admitted? Um, often there are 
things missing such as the amount of product being distributed, where it will be distributed and sold, um, and the labels that would be used um, on the temporary market permit product. Is supporting information submitted to FDA for a TMP uh, accessible via the Freedom of Information Act? That's a good question. I think if there is um, commercial, commercial sensitive information, I do not believe, I believe that would be covered, not covered by, FO, by FOIA. Um, I'm trying to remember. To my knowledge, when I was there, uh, I did not see anybody come in with a FOIA request um, for somebody else's TMP application. Okay. That doesn't mean that it couldn't uh, happen. <laughs> um, so. And right now, those are I don't see any, any other questions coming in. Uh, so I want to thank everyone for joining us. We have recorded this webinar. It will be up on the EAS webpage in about a week. Uh, for those who are interested, our next food-focused webinar is on environmental uh, monitoring. And that will be on September 21st. You can register uh, via the EAS website or more information on that will be coming out in our newsletter next month. Uh, so thank you again, April, for a, a very informative webinar. Thanks everyone for joining us and we look forward to seeing you again.